Hi, this week oh, we're going back to the brachial plexus again, partly because, you know, we love the brachial plexus. It's a great bit of anatomy, but we're going to look at uh, Klumke's palsy. We looked at Herb's palsy a little while ago, which is also known as an upper brachial plexus injury. This is an example of a lower brachial plexus injury. It's rare, but there's a number of reasons for looking at the anatomy. One, it helps me reinforce why this anatomy is so important. Two, many of you actually find it easier to study anatomy through clinical scenarios or through clinical context, because then it has reason, it makes sense. And three, if you're working clinically, you may come across this. And if you understand the anatomy well, then you can, I mean, probably the most important part is it can occur in young children as an obstetric injury. So you can explain to the parents what's happened. So what's the plan? Well, okay, I will describe the position that we see as a result of this paralysis or this palsy. We will look at the anatomy of the brachial plexus, that is the nerves that are supplying the upper limb. We'll consider the bit that gets injured and how it gets injured. And then we'll think about the nerves that have been affected, what muscles those nerves innervate, and that will explain why we see what we see. Okay, so what is Klumke's palsy, also known as Klumke's paralysis? Klumke, 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 Klumke. So it's a good name. Anyway, what do we see? Okay, so we see, uh, if this is pronation, supination, pronation, supination of the forearm, we see the forearm supinated, the wrist extended, the metacarpophalangeal joints extended, right, so extended like this, and then we see the middle and distal interphalangeal joints flexed. So we see what, you know, might be called a claw hand position. And the, that finger and that finger, that is the index finger and the middle finger, um, are more greatly affected than the little finger and the ring finger, which adds some extra complexity to the anatomy here. But we can explain why as we go, okay? I was climbing some really sharp rocks this weekend. I've got loads of holes in my hands. Ow! but the hand is pulled into this position. So what's pulling the hand into this position? Muscles, and muscles work as agonists and antagonists. We have tone throughout our body. You know, if you were to switch off all your muscles right now, you can imagine what would happen. You just <laughs> So muscles tend to be on to some extent. They tend to be pulling to some extent, and muscles will pull against one another to put joints into a certain position, which means that if muscles on one side are paralyzed, are no longer innervated, then the other muscles can contract unopposed, pulling us into a particular position. So that's what's going on here. Um, the other thing we'll see is weakness in the hand. So the intrinsic muscles, the muscles within the hand are greatly affected. So those of you that have got good knowledge of anatomy of the upper limb will be jumping to a nerve or two there that you think might be uh, responsible for this. So we see weakness in the hand and we may see some, some sensory loss um, in kind of in, in, in these dermatomes. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so maybe you've got an idea of where we're going. Let's go whoop, all the way back up to the neck, have a look at the brachial plexus, shall we? So here's the brachial plexus of the right side. And what we have, um, we have the cervical spinal cord up here and the brachial plexus is a bunch of spinal nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1 spinal nerves coming out of the spinal cord and they come together. So a plexus then is, is I usually describe it as um, cable management, right? If you think about each, each nerve, each spinal nerve inside there, you've got millions of neurons. Each one of those neurons is a, is a fiber, is like a copper wire. And you're gonna send that copper wire to a target somewhere. You bundle them all together into bigger wires. You bundle those wires together. Sometimes they move from place to place, but essentially you bundle the ones that are going to the same place together and you bundle the other ones that are going to another place together, right? 
that's a plexus. There aren't any connections in here, you're just bundling those wires. So we see those roots coming together as trunks. So we have an upper, middle and lower trunk. And then after the trunks, we see divisions where we see some more crossing over. And then this artery here is becoming the axillary artery here. And the brachial plexus is wrapped around the axillary artery. And uh, these cords here, these are the cords of the brachial plexus, they get named relative to their position around the axillary artery. And then from there, we're seeing the nerves of the upper limb. The, the four major nerves are musculocutaneous, radial, median and ulnar nerves. So that's what it looks like in 3D. We can have a look at this. Um, uh, this is an illustration from Wikipedia. It's in Wikimedia Commons. So this is a, an illustration of the brachial plexus that make it, might make a little bit more sense. But what we're interested in here, so in Klumpke's palsy, which is also known as a lower brachial plexus injury, we're thinking about the, the inferior trunk the lower trunk here, or more often, we're thinking about the C8 and the T1 roots that come together and form that trunk. Why? How come that bit of the, the brachial plexus can be injured? Well, um, that movement basically, so when we were looking at Herb's palsy, we said that an upper brachial plexus injury is caused by the head being pulled away from the shoulder and that stretches the upper trunk and can damage the neurons in a number of different ways. If you remember that a nerve is a collection of neurons inside some connective tissue, that can be damaged in a number of different ways. Nerves can stretch a little bit, um, but the amount they can stretch is limited. So if you stretch them too much, you might damage the neurons and the nerve as a whole in a way that is recoverable or you might damage it in a way that is irrecoverable, such as if you were to cut through the nerve and the whole, the two parts are separated. So there are gradations of injury, which will give us gradations of effects and recovery, right? We need to think about that. With a lower brachial plexus injury, the arm is abducted and usually raised above the body. The classic textbook description is you fall out of a tree and you grab a branch. So you grab the branch, but your whole body weight pulls around and that, that can theoretically stretch the, the lower trunk of the brachial plexus or the C8 and T1 roots, but it's rare. Um, this comes up obstet obstetrically because during birth, if the baby's passing through the birth canal and the arm gets pulled, look, it's in the same position, isn't it? Um, the arm is abducted. So pulling on the arm and pulling the baby from the birth canal can also injure the brachial plexus, the, the lower brachial plexus, because you know, in a baby, you can imagine how it might be a little bit more delicate, right? Okay then, so if we go back to our diagram of the brachial plexus, look at the C8 and T1 roots see how they come together to form the trunk, follow that through and see the cord and what are the major nerves that are being formed from those C8 and T1 roots. It's the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. The median nerve is most heavily affected by damage to the C8 and T1 nerve roots. The ulnar nerve is also damaged to some respect. So the median nerve is our biggie, also the ulnar nerve. The median nerve and the ulnar nerve have been compromised to some degree. All right, what do those do in the, in the upper limb then? Right, well, I like to group things into compartments. The median nerve innervates most of the muscles of the anterior compartment of the forearm. Um, so most of the muscles that flex the wrist and flex the fingers and then the median nerve runs into the hand and innervates the intrinsic muscles of the thumb and innervates a couple of the lumbrical muscles here. We'll come back to those later. Now the median nerve also innervates the two muscles, pronator quadratus and pronator teres, which would pronate the forearm. Median nerve innervates those muscles. Yeah, are you, do you remember what I said? Yeah, 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 yeah. The ulnar nerve, which you know because it bangs, it goes around the medial epicondyle of the humerus. If you bang it, you bang your funny bone. The ulnar nerve runs around, it also innervates um, a bit of flexor digitorum profundus, which flexes the fingers. 
But if you've banged your funny bone, you'll know the tingle goes to the little fingers, right? So the ulnar nerve runs to innervate most of the intrinsic muscles of the hand um, and the lumbricals on this side. The ulnar nerve also, being on the ulnar side, innervates the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle, which is one of the wrist flexors. All right, so that's our anatomy. Let's add it all up. The median nerve is heavily affected and is paralyzed or weak. The ulnar nerve is fairly heavily affected and is also paralyzed or weak. Um, meaning that those muscles that flex the wrist will be weak or paralyzed. So the muscles on the opposite side will be able to pull unopposed. So they'll pull the wrist into that extended position. Those pronation muscles that I talked about that were innervated by the median nerve, they are now weak or paralyzed, which means the muscles that supinate will be able to pull the forearm into a supinated position, unopposed. And um, the median nerve that innervates the finger flexors won't be able to flex the fingers. There'll be weakness in the hand, right? There'll be a loss of power in grip and the, the median nerve innervating the muscles of the thumb means there will be a loss of, loss of grip strength, a grip, grip power, okay? Um, now, the tricky bit here is that, so the extensor muscles of the forearm that go to the digits will want to extend the fingers, and the muscles that flex the fingers will find it difficult to oppose that. But the lumbrical muscles are little wormy muscles that run from tendon to the connected tissue of the finger. What the lumbrical muscles do is essentially let you flex the metacarpophalangeal joint and keep the finger straight. There's a video about this somewhere, right? Metacarpal, sorry, the, the lumbrical muscles. Um, what this means is that because the lumbrical muscles for these two fingers, which were innervated by the median nerve, have been greatly affected, and the lumbrical muscles innervated by the ulnar nerve over here have been a little affected. This means that what we see is we see extension of that metacarpophalangeal joint here, and we see a little bit of flexion of the middle and distal interphalangeal joints. The movements of the hand are quite a complicated thing. Uh, we have great dexterity here that we kind of take for granted, which is why the hands and the nerves that innervate the hand are so important and the anatomy to the upper limb is so important. Um, but if you want to, I mean, the, this finger cheats a little bit because it's got an extra muscle, but if you want to, <laughs> if you want to do this, um, the lumbrical muscles run from a tendon to the connective tissue hood that covers a digit and they pull on the back of that hood to extend the fingers. It's not just the extensor muscles on the other side that let you, that let you do that. You need the lumbrical muscles to, to put the fingers into this sort of position by pulling on these connective tissues here, right? Um, so if the, if the lumbrical muscles are out of action, these antagonistic muscles that are pulling against these agonistic muscles which are now paralyzed or weak, mean that you don't pull the hand into that. Oh, actually, it's really hard for me to pull my hand into that position. Is that because I'm a rock climber and all these muscles are too tight? But maybe it's the same for everybody. You try it right now. But if you, if you just, you know, it's not just a case that these muscles pull the hand into that position. The hand gets pulled into, into this position. Lumbricals are the key. So that gives us supination, wrist extension, extension of the metacarpophalangeal joints, flexion of the distal and uh, middle interphalangeal joints, and weakness, most importantly, weakness of the hand and grip strength. This is why when anybody talks about Klumpke's palsy, they jump to the features in the hand beyond elsewhere in the upper limb. What about sensory stuff? Okay, we need to think about dermatomes. Let's have a look at that brachial plexus diagram again. Um, and you can see there are a couple of cutaneous nerves there coming from the area that we've been looking at. Look, look at C8, T1, follow them across and we see the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So that would innervate this region of skin and this region of skin here. So there might be a loss of sensation 
around here. Now, dermatome maps describe the spinal segments that send sensory innovation to different regions of the body. And the limbs are a little bit crooked, but look at this dermatome map. And you can see on the dermatome map that where we'd expect to see the C8 and T1 regions of skin, as in the regions of skin innervated by C8 and T1 dermatome regions or innervated by spinal nerves from those regions. Those are the regions that are innervated by the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So there's likely to be a loss of sensation around here too. Okay, does that make sense? Now if we look at that, if we look at that brachial plexus diagram again, consider that there's also a medial pectoral nerve there which runs to pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. So those muscles could be affected. And the severity of the injury will change depending upon how close the injury is to the spinal cord. We have the sympathetic trunk coming out of the T1 to T12 or L1 levels. So if the T1 root is injured, then the sympathetic nerves coming out of that root may also be injured. And those sympathetic nerves run up into the neck and the head. So that could give Horner's syndrome. I will talk about that in another video, but you'll see constriction of the pupil and drooping of the eyelid. Um, and that would be Horner's syndrome. So that would be an injury that's it's closer to the spinal cord that's even more damaging. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so that is the anatomy of a Klumpke's palsy or Klumpke's paralysis or an inferior or lower brachial, brachial plexus injury. So we're thinking C8, T1 roots, inferior trunk, medial cord, median nerve and ulnar nerve. See, look how we're adding all our anatomy together. Median nerve, median nerve, ulnar nerve. So this is lost. So we see supination because the pronators can't work against the supinators, so the supinators win. We see wrist extension for the same reason. The wrist extenders, extensors work, whereas the wrist flexors don't work. And then we see flexion of the, met sorry, we see extension of the metacarpophalangeal joints and extension of the interphalangeal joints to give us this position. And most importantly, we get weakness of the hand. That's the anatomy. That explains what we see. That explains what has happened. Um, and hopefully if the injury isn't too severe, the nerves will recover and the function will recover. But that <coughs> is for somebody else to talk about. Okay, right. See you next week.